Hello, just friends. This is International Master Valerio Lewov, and today I'd like to continue the discussion on structures, and more importantly, want to focus on the ideas of the four different stages of um, the game, which we call are the opening, early middle game, late middle game. Then we have the idea of uh, end game. So opening, early, late middle game, and end game. Four stages. So the first thing you need to know about these four stages is that uh, they're very important for a number of reasons. The key being you need to be thinking ab that about each of those as a separate way, as a separate type of uh, you know, like stage of the game in which you have to approach things differently. Now, is it possible to approach them in one way? Rarely. But let's talk a bit about that. I'd like to show you a couple of great examples. The first one we're going to see was actually played in a game between John Nunn and Viktor Korchnoi. It was played in Reykjavik in 1988. As you can see, the start of this opening suggests what white is, what black has already done. He sacrificed the pawn. This is the so-called Benko gambit. And in a way, it's not that bad. We realize that, okay, white has already given a little extra support to the, to the pawn on b5, and things are actually okay. He's uh, intending to effectively develop some of his pieces, like with bishop d3 and other moves. So uh, what should uh, white, what should black be doing in this position? Very good question to begin with. When you go for a question like that, when you start with a query like this, I'd recommend always uh, focus your attention at what stage you are. We are still at the opening stage. Now that's pretty important. Why? Because in the opening, everything is about development. Now what goes when our opponent violates that principle? And he does not develop, as in this case, White has already taken the pawn and is actually focused on an idea to, uh, you know, just gain a little more space instead of focusing on better ways to finalize his development. So what do we do in that particular case scenario? Well, if you're at such a stage, the thing that I would recommend you to do most is going to be think and focus on how and it's a huge idea, so don't forget it. Think and focus on how you, yourself, can challenge the opponent. That means, in some way, when he has violated the rules, as long as it doesn't cause you any special risk, you can do that too, in case you are able to create different threats. So remember that. If your opponent has violated the rules of, his, of good development, you could be thinking a little bit more, uh, you know, in that in that sense. So what can we say about that type of position? Um, well, let's think. Why does not develop? So he's, he's having his king behind in a pretty bad-looking position. So what would you suggest should be the most energetic way for black to take advantage and counter black, counter white in this moment? So... Um, First thing that you need to do is look for threats or pressure of some kind. If you do it this way, then you could take the initiative or at least begin with that. So, move the black blade was actually knight to the h5. This is great. So, like, the thing that we are having in this position is that you know, there's going to be the attack on the uh, f4. And um, then we are able to attack effectively because of h6. There is h6 as a pressure. There is a real problem that white will have to experience in this moment. It's a good deal we're, we're getting on with. Not h5. See? Now... The good thing is that in these type of situations, we could allow ourselves to spend an extra move or two to carry on the attack because these moves are going to be with a tempo. They're going to create an actual problem to the opponent. It's not just going to be a quiet move, uh, you know, that violates our development. No, of course not. We don't care about quiet moves here. We just want to be a little more effective and aggressive with the different plans. So uh, there it is. 
It's a good idea. And uh, so just it's pretty interesting. With the H6 and the Knight takes to the F4, there's already quite a bit in uh, in line with the black with the black activity in the attack. So just has to figure out how to use it. Okay. Queen F3. Now what does black do? After Queen F3, black plays F6, Bishop H4, and then there is Knight takes F4. Wonderful. I really like that last move. I mean, for a number of reasons, but the most important being is that it opens the position. Now, as soon as black takes this, is going to have a problem due to the G5 idea and the reality that black could, uh, you know, effectively get the necessary space. And uh, um, this, it's going to be great. So, um, let's take a look. In fact, after this move of... Um, Knight takes f4, now white plays queen takes f4, and then there's g5. We engage him. We do not give him the ability to effectively and easily develop. And as we do it this way, it's all working out. You know, just like he's got to worry right here. He's got to be thinking of a problem. The bishop on h4, the queen on f4, the rest of the pieces that just don't feel like they're so good. And then what white plays is a move queen f2. He really doesn't have that many other things to do. He's got to go back. And what is black going to do in this particular case? Well, let's go for the idea of g dix h. It's excellent. A lot of the times, these type of tactics are going to be wrong for you. But once again, if your opponent has violated the rules of the development, you are allowed to do it as well. In the name of the attack only. Remember, caution. In the name, If you don't have an attack going on with this, or it's not going to persevere, don't do it. So knight e5, bishop e2. So how do we get going from this position? It's a pretty good position, okay? It's not that. But apparently we need to we need more. We need to be thinking about, you know, like some sort of attacks or whatever it is. How can we go for this? How can we do it? That is a great question. A really good question, actually. Um, to figure things out like this in a position of that kind, you need to know a couple of things. First off, we're really well set. I mean, uh, black is great with that knight and a couple of pieces that just look fantastic. So what he needed to do in this position of the bishop b2 is just to continue working out. He needed to continue advancing, opening up more lines, and getting more opportunities. So uh, that is a great way to go for it. With 8x to the b, we're also getting to advance for a move play queen to the a5, which I would actually love as a part of the, uh, of the, part, as a part of the plan. So we start it that way. Remember, constantly think about moves that threaten him. Don't do it at the cost of your own development or at the cost of your own risk. As long as it's going to help you get a tempo, pressure him down, or allow you to develop a piece, like 8x to the b was with a tempo and queen a5 was with a development, things work out. So take a second right now. This is a really good position to talk about. So everything really comes down to how do we continue. Pretty good. Everything's in place. The position is apparently quite good. So, how to increase it? How to do something better right over here? It's a great question. It's a great question. Well, after queen to g3, black simply advanced with queen b4. It's great. It's a tempo move. It does not put us at any risk. And it gives you the chance and the ability to stand a bit stronger and more powerful at that moment. Always do it that way. Even if you can't make the attack necessarily happen, just make your pieces get a little bit better, a little bit stronger. And we have a lot of features, a lot of attacks in that moment as it goes. Um, it was good. Then uh, right after that move is played, actually, now we have b2 to, uh, to trouble. We got our queen. We have a rook that's wonderfully placed on the line. White's king is badly positioned. So, in that way, white played rook b1. He just didn't see too many different moves or resources. So he decided, okay, I'm going to go to protect. 
I'm going to get ready and I'll do it uh, nicely. So it feels like the right move to go. So what do we do? B1. Now take a second. You need to think about this position very carefully so you can decide. Uh, the truth is that with the, you know, with the current position, black has already built almost everything that he needs. Space, check. Control, check. Activity, check. It's all there. It's all good. But apparently we need a little more if we're going to prove this successful. What would be your move? Take a moment here. See, the peace activity and the structure literally guarantee a lot of Black's command and a momentum. It's really good to have it. But being able to use it is not that simple. Obviously, we need a bit, a bit more. And that's where Black's next move really came out. And then his actual next variation was 100% brilliant. And uh, so, in fact, what you find out in this type of position is a black place, a rook takes a2. We have a real strong resource. We're ready. We're getting ready to open up. And then we have the ability to think about, to think uh, in, in regards to tension or pressure against b5 and everything else. This is wonderful. White plays knight takes a2. And then black just plays queen takes to the b5. Now you might argue, but Valeri, this is not a good tactic. It doesn't bring black any immediate victory. And you got to understand this. In chess, there are two kinds of sacrifices we could do. There is a positional sacrifice. There is a tactical sacrifice. Now the tactical sacrifice we all know about. These are moves that, that tactically help you to open up the opponent's position, create different sorts of threats, and it's all good. But, see, remember, you have to consider any way to just keep the opponent on the back side. So, if you have a tactical sacrifice, you know, you could think about taking the initiative, you know, and then eventually getting uh, to constantly create threats against the opponent. Or, on another hand, you know, you could be thinking about the, the possibility to actually th think about uh, positional sacrifice, which helps you to just have a good pressure. So, pressure leads positional sacrifice. That's the requirement. Okay? And uh, the other one, you know, basically... The tactical sacrifice leads to initiative. So this is really interesting. Knowing about these two kinds, you know exactly what type of sacrifice you can make. And if you have enough to really sustain it, instead of just you know doing it and uh, then figuring out, oh, I don't have enough follow-up. Like, yeah, I don't have initiative. Or I don't have enough much of a, uh, you know, like, uh, pressure that I can go by and consider. It's important. So let's see what happened in the game. Queen takes to b5, then uh, white plays knight c3, queen a6. Pressure often means your ability to keep your opponent longer in that bad or the difficult position that he's in. You know, and then now with the skink on the f1 square, you can realize why that actually turns out to be so difficult for him. It's not just the fact that he's uh, behind. It is the fact that white's coming down. He's going to do different sorts of threats, different type of things. So, that's pretty good. Well, in that sense, after queen a6, apparently black was superior. Uh, queen a6, king d1. Now I need you to think. I want you to really consider this uh, huge, it's a huge position. It's a great moment. And we have to know exactly what's happening. What is the black best idea in this position? Considering that almost everything is well placed and uh, correctly executed in a, in a sense. It's a, good, it's a good question. Really. <laughs> Take a moment. Think about it. And try to figure things out. What is the best way to plan or move ahead here?
Now, as I get to think about the position right now, the first thing that comes to my mind is, okay, this is huge. It's a great position. Something really important has to happen. But how the hell is it going to happen? I don't see a way to go directly. There's no breakthrough point or anything that great. So it's kind of unclear almost, the ideas of the position. But first and foremost, you have to understand, you could be thinking about two types of moves. One, reinforcing moves, the kinds of moves that help you to add new forces into the play and make it more powerful. Or two, the kinds of moves that help you to actually open up new lines. Ultimately, those are the two key elements that you'd always need for any type of flying attack. Get new lines and open up new pieces. It's perfect. That is what white needed in this position. That is what black needed in this position. If white exchanges, black will recapture very quickly with the with the bishop, so that he's going to get enough turning uh, and power against the opponent. Remember, open lines and more pieces. The two key ingredients to a successful attack. Which one did Black actually play? Did he do f5 directly or did he do something else? Well, neither, actually. Uh, let me take a look. Uh, well, no, sorry. He did play f5. Rook f1. And now he played f6. f5 was with, was with the idea to open up the, the space. Rook f6 is with the plan to just get the rook around and have enough of a firepower and possibilities. Now this was as this bishop, as this rook is coming up, we're ready to uh, go through. We can have that option to advance it even towards the g6 and uh, keep the opponent a little bit more on defense on the defense. It's great. It really is. Looking at this now, I don't really believe why it's going to have anything. Remember that idea. You've got to be thinking. How can you apply these two? So, open space and constantly add more pieces into the, into the attack. So, um, you know, actually, well, what happens in the game after this is a pretty, pretty key. Um, rook f6, e takes f5, bishop takes f5. Now white so that in case of rook c1, there's going to be knight of the d3. And so he'll likely lose pretty badly, pretty painfully in this position. And, um, of course, uh, then after that, uh, you know, just a, white is really really you know just in a bad type of position so uh, let's see uh, after this knight to the d3 okay that was a that was going to be horrible so he couldn't do it he played with the move of rook takes f5 rook takes f5 king c2 now what should black do here you might want to take a second and try to figure out this on your own because this is a key position i think that black has uh not so badly placed, he's got some space and things. But uh, it's still a good question. So what should uh, what should be the right sequence in this moment? Hmm. You know, uh, the thing I find most difficult and most chess players find rather difficult in such a position is thinking of, you know, like, Finding out the right moves when there is nothing that dangerous we can do. And what I mean is, we're looking. imagine that we're, you're looking for a tactical sequence or a move that can help you to break down his position. But it just isn't there for whatever reason. So what do you do? I mean, some people are going to be thinking about, uh, you know, launching a sort of, you know, set of threats against the opponent. Others will be looking at something else. I say prophylaxis. Now remember that prophylactical type of moves are essential for any of these positions. So think about this. You cannot make your attack unless you think about moves of this kind. Prophylactic moves. That move not only helps the king to feel a little safer, but it also brings the uh, sorry, the, brings the bishop into the play. So now white's trying a counter attack here. It's pretty good. So what do we do? 
Hmm. Uh, you know, I think this is a bit difficult. Just, it's really hard to figure out what to do because if we remove the queen, we've lost our attack, we've lost our energy. And now there's the best idea. Do you know when the pieces really come together, like when, when everything comes together to win? Oftentimes there is this one key element. I call it coordination is the key. Because when you think about getting your pieces together and make them support one another towards a certain target, I mean, you will find out how difficult it is for your opponent um, you know, to defend. In is you're gonna see the strength of your forces as opposed to his defenses. And uh, you no, know, that is a huge idea right now, which led to rook f2 check. Amazing move. Okay, so this is very very interesting. You know, like one of the things that you could do in this type of position, um, you know, is uh, l calculate. Apparently, you need to calculate things up. But, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Rook f2 was done. Then uh, white had to move back. He couldn't take it due to queen d3. He had to move his king right away. And then when he did, there was rook c f1 here. Rook takes a2. And queen takes a2, which was clearly winning. I really love this position because of the many different little points that, that make it so good. And yet, it's those little points that we care so much about. When we do this right, it's, uh, it's brilliant. White could not have actually fought or done anything uh, anything relevant in general. So that was a, was a really great, a great thing. So uh, I hope that you found those type of ideas useful. And uh, again, it always takes a bit more time and uh, like some different ideas. And uh, you can keep those and let, you know, try to consider them in your next game.